Hi, this is me, Georgia May Mossholder, with Beyond the Gathering Storm, Chapter 12. And we're up north a little bit. Elizabeth found herself pacing the floor as she anxiously waited for Wynne to come home. He was not later than usual, and normally she kept her emotions firmly in control. But her latest phone conversation with Christine had left her agitated. Even Tico whined and shifted position in the room at her restlessness. <coughs> she heard the dog, but paid little attention. Elizabeth heard Wynne let himself in the door. She and Tico both were facing him as he entered the room. His eyes moved from the face of his wife to the whining dog. Oh, something wrong with him? he asked as he removed his coat. Elizabeth looked quickly at the husky. I, I don't think so. Why? Well, he doesn't normally just lie there and let me walk in. Tico meets me at the door and nearly bowls me over. At the sound of his name, Tico leaped to his feet and went bounding forward, tail sweeping great arcs from side to side. He appeared to be fine. Wynn reached over to take the silky head between his palms and rock him back and forth. The dog rumbled his pleasure. Supper's ready, said Elizabeth, pulling her thoughts back together. She started for the small kitchen where the evening meal had been prepared. I'll be there just as soon as I get some grime off my hands, Wynne responded and disappeared into the bathroom. He came back out, refastening his cuff buttons. Phew, he said. Wish it was as easy to wash away the mental grime. Mental grime? Elizabeth was putting out the bowl of mashed potatoes and a small platter of venison steaks. She went back for the carrots as Wynne continued his comments. Well, some days one has no choice but to deal with society's filth. And uh, this was one of those days? She asked over her shoulder. He nodded. Our world isn't getting any better or cleaner, Elizabeth. I don't know how people can treat one another the way they do, or themselves for that matter. She did not ask questions. She wasn't sure she wanted to hear the answers. I uh, talked to Chrissy, she said instead. She saw she had his immediate attention. Well, how are things? I gather she's still very involved with that young man, though she didn't say so directly. I thought she, I thought he was away at university. Oh, he is. But they corresponded. Well, she corresponds. He phones. She's always antsy when I call, since he might be trying to get the line. She quite cut me off today. Oh, she did apologize, but said he hadn't called her yet this week and she was sure he'd try tonight. He took his usual place at the table. Is uh, that what upset you? He asked quietly. I didn't say I was upset. He smiled. No. And if you're honest, I don't think you'll say that you're not. Well, Maybe I'm upset a, a little, she admitted, but I don't think it was that, at least, at least not only that. She looked at her husband, waiting patiently for her to continue. I don't know, I can't really put my finger on it. She just seems different, distant. She's rather evasive and sometimes almost testy. It's, it's just not like Christine, she finished lamely. I wish we could get that fellow up here and take a look at him, muttered Wynne, as Elizabeth joined him at the table. 
I have a feeling that would answer a lot of our questions. Well, having her home for Christmas will help. At least we'll be able to figure out where she is and what's going on with her. Thankfully, it's only a few weeks away. What about Henry? Has he worked out his duty roster? I still haven't heard. He was having a hard time trying to schedule each of the officers a bit of time off. Oh, it's difficult when you have so few men. But of course you know all about that. I, I remember some Christmases when you had to go out. Elizabeth shook her head and didn't finish. I expect you'll end up staying there, he said, Wynne said slowly. One of his men is married. He, he'll need time with his family. The other young officer won't be able to take all the shifts alone. Unfortunately, Christmas can be a tense time. Lots of people celebrate too much. Not too much. Just in the wrong way, corrected Elizabeth soberly. They now joined hands and Wynne led them in the evening table grace. Elizabeth passed the meat platter, a sigh escaping her lips. You know, it used to be so easy when they were little and all we had to worry about was keeping them fed and clothed and happy. <laughs> you worry too much. Oh, I've told myself that dozens of times. The dog yawned and stretched out beside Wynne's chair. It's, it's just that they're so far away. I, I feel like I've lost contact. Well, do you think it would be easier if they were close and you were more involved? I, I, I honestly don't know. All I know is that I feel disconnected and it's frightening. His smile was sympathetic. You've raised them well, Elizabeth. You have a God you can trust. I know I shouldn't worry. What exactly did Christine say? Wynne asked when he pushed back his empty plate. Elizabeth moved to get the tea. Not too much. It was more what she didn't say. Mr. Kingsley and his son have both put pressure on her to move into the Kingsley house. Huh. She, she's not considering that, is she? She heard genuine concern in his voice. She told them no again, but I'm afraid if they keep at her about it, she might give in. I'd hate to see her do that. I, I think it would be a dreadful mistake. He nodded in agreement. Maybe I should give her a call. Maybe you should call the Kingsley fellow. Huh, I'd rather not, his answer came quickly. Christine might see it as interference, like we don't trust her. Well, do we? She studied his face as she continued. Oh, I, I know we trust Christine. She stood firmly for what she knows is right. But if they keep on badgering her and pushing her, what young girl on her own can stand against that? Particularly when one of them is her boss and the other seems to be capturing her heart. She said that Mr. Kingsley thinks she's a good influence on his son. Now I ask you, why does his son need a good influence? What kind of young man is he? Christine won't say much, just that she's sure we like him. Then she goes on about the beautiful roses he sent or the dinner at the fancy restaurant. As though that makes a man. I, I just don't like the sound of the whole thing. He's going to be home for Christmas? Elizabeth nodded. She could feel the worried frown on her forehead and she con consciously made an effort to relax her expression. I'll talk to her. Wynne's confident tone was comforting. She told me she was cooking a supper for the boss tonight. She does that now and then. I think she might be trying to appease him for refusing his invitation to move to his house. 
She said he's having another couple in tonight as guests. His brother and his wife, I think. They are visiting the city. Well, that shouldn't make her too late. I'll phone and leave a message for her to call when she gets back. Oh, she's already had one call for today from me. The landlady allows each boarder only one call a day. Even if we call her? Well, if she talks to someone who calls in, then she can't make a call out, is the way I understand it. Boy, that's pretty rigid. I suppose they need rules. Some boarders would be on the phone all the time. Well, I'm going to give it a try anyway. Mrs. Green, is it? Elizabeth nodded, but she felt so frustrated with his feeling of being cut off from her children. It was well after nine when the return call came from Christine. She sounded nervous. Is something wrong? was her first question to Wynne. Wrong? No, I just wanted... Oh, thank the Lord, she exclaimed. I was afraid something had happened especially since I already talked with Mother earlier. Well, I'm sorry. I certainly didn't mean to frighten you. And I didn't really expect you to call back tonight. Your mother said you already had your call for today. Well, I, I thought it might be an emergency, so Mrs. Green... I'm sorry, Wynne said again. It's just, you never call twice in, in one day. I didn't get to talk with you earlier when your mother did. I thought it was my turn. Wynne decided to change the subject. Your mother said you were playing chef again. How did it go? Fine, answered Christine, but her voice still sounded shaky. He was truly sorry for giving her such a start. He quickly realized this call probably would do little to alleviate their concerns. She was far too emotionally wrought to express her other feelings. Tell me about it. Oh, I only have five minutes. You're right. Don't bother telling me about the meal. Tell me about you. How's everything going? Fine. You still like your job? Most days. And other days? Well, it, it gets a little hectic at times, especially at month's end when everybody wants everything right now. Then we get behind in the filing and some get a little testy as we try to catch up. I wish I had someone to do my filing, he chuckled. Dad, you have no idea what filing is, she exclaimed. With eight typists constantly spewing out sheaves of paper, it can bury a desk in a day. He laughed outright. She was sounding much more like herself. Do you have to do it all? No, we each do our own. Well, then why the fuss? Well, everybody wants the file drawers at the same time. We practically pushed for them. It's like, it's like a bunch of moose at a wallow. He laughed again. She doesn't sound so bad, he was mentally assessing. I think her mother is overly concerned. So how's the young man? You mean Boyd? Yes. Boyd. Fine. Now her voice had taken a different tone. Mother said you were waiting for to hear from him. Did he call? Oh, we called him from Mr. Kingsley's. And is everything is going well at university? Fine. Good. My time is almost up. I know, it, it passes too quickly. It, at least we'll be able to catch up on everything when you come home for Christmas. There was a pause. For a minute, Wynne thought Mrs. Green had cut them off. Yes, well, we need to talk about that. Her voice finally came back across the wires. I may not make it home after all. Boyd has asked that I stay, and, and I've been thinking... I'd kind of like to give them Christmas this year. I mean, a real one. They haven't had one, you know, since his mother died, and he can't even remember that. It's sad. 
But I have to go. We'll talk about it later. Love you, Dad. Bye. He managed a love you too before the phone clicked, then hummed. Mutely, he stood with the receiver in his hand. He wished he hadn't called. How could he tell Elizabeth that their daughter might not be coming home for Christmas either? The next day, the post brought a letter from Henry. As difficult as it was to wait, Elizabeth put it up on the small shelf by the radio until Wynn returned home for the noon meal. He was hardly in the door before she told him of it. Well, what did he say? Will he be home? I waited for you. <laughs> you should have gone ahead. Oh, we don't get many letters from the children. I, I thought we should share it. Wynne nodded and smiled and gave her a hug. Should we wait until after we've eaten? He asked, his voice teasing. But she was already on her way to get the envelope. Elizabeth slid it open carefully and read aloud. Dear Dad and Mom, I've been putting off getting in touch, with, in touch until I had things worked out here. Regretfully, I will be unable to get home for Christmas. It's too far to travel for such a short time. There are just the three of us, and Rogers needs some family time, and Larray hasn't had much experience. So I figured I'd better stay in place. I sure will miss you. Otherwise, things are going quite well here. I'm beginning to feel at home in the church. I wish it were possible for me to attend every Sunday. It's hard to get involved when one is there only now and then. I did start sort of a boys club, though, for 8 to 12-year-olds. We don't do anything too exciting. Just go on hikes and fish a bit, etc. They seem to think it's great, though. It reminds me of your Sunday school group, Dad. The boys want an honest-to-goodness camping trip in the spring. I promised them I'd think about it. Rogers did put me in touch with a real estate agent who finally managed to find a little place for me. It's not much, only a couple of rather shabby little rooms, but it does have a stove and I can make my own meals. I still go down to Jesse's with the fellows now and then, but at least my poor stomach is getting a break. I've had some more Sunday dinner invitations, and believe me, they are greatly appreciated, at least most of the time. I've been in a few houses where the woman can, couldn't cook worth a nickel, and a few others where the daughter was a bit too forward. But all in all, I've welcomed the change from what Jesse or I can scrape up. I was wondering, Dad, if you've been able to get any of that root for arthritis that we talked about. Poor Mr. Martin seems a little worse each time I see him. It's sad because he's really not that old. Trust you are both keeping well. You are in my daily prayers. With my love, Henry. Elizabeth folded the letter slowly. She thought she had prepared herself for the possibility that Henry would not be able to make it home. But it did not seem to have lessened the keen disappointment she was feeling. No word about the young woman? Wynne commented. What young woman? Elizabeth's attention returned to the present. The young widow and her son. I suppose there was nothing to say, said Elizabeth with a sigh. She had no idea why Wynne should mention her. What did she have to do with Henry? The long-ago accident in the North had no bearing on him now, did it? Suddenly she turned to her husband. What exactly did Henry tell you about that window, widow? Well, not a lot. Then why did you ask about her? Uh, I told you at the time. Henry was deeply affected by it all. It had bothered him for months, years, a death such as that would. It wasn't only the death, it was the circumstances, the young woman, the baby. It's tough to explain, Beth, but when you are the one who has to take the news, 
you somehow share the pain. Yet you are cut off, not allowed to grieve with the family. It sort of ties you together in some unexplained way, yet holds you apart. It's an odd mixture of responsibility and desire to help. Finding her again. He found her again? Elizabeth interrupted. You mean she is living in the same town as Henry? Well, yeah, I, I thought I told you. Wynne's voice sounded uncertain as he paused in thought. Henry told me about it in a phone call. He paused again. Well, anyway, it's not often that lives crisscross like that, but I get the feeling Henry still feels he owes her and the boys something. Still wants to help. Elizabeth nodded. It must put one in an awful position, she nodded. I hadn't realized how personal it could become. Well, maybe it will make it easier knowing that she has a family. At least she's not all on her own. Elizabeth agreed, but was still troubled as she went to serve the soup. When she returned, she was feeling a little better and said, I'll thank you, Wynn Delaney, to not forget to tell me important pieces of information about our children. He ducked in mock fright, and they both laughed. The herbal medication finally arrived by a carrier who came from the north. The Indian chief to whom Wynne had appealed seemed most proud that someone of Wynne's stature and experience would ask for medicine from his tribe. He sent out a good supply. Wynne packaged it up immediately and mailed it off to Henry. There really aren't any directions with this, Wynne wrote, but if I remember correctly, they made their tea with boiling water, which they drank morning and evening. They used a good-sized pinch in each cupful. Sometimes I saw them drink more than one cup at a time, but usually it was just the one. Sure hopes this helps your friend. Joe Beavertail says it will take three full moons, and you know how long that is before the man will know if it helps. But he's not to quit taking it then. It doesn't mean the arthritis has been cured, it just means the medicine has it under control. If he thinks it helps, they are willing to send him more. We'll pray that it helps. Love, Dad. Chapter 13 A winter blizzard was sweeping across the prairies when the call came in to the RCMP office. Due to poor visibility, there had been a motor accident on one of the local roads. The caller had little further information to provide. He just banged on my door and asked me to phone the police, she said, her voice trembling. Pencil in hand, Henry took all the information he could gather. When he hung up, he turned to his two junior officers, said, who had only heard half of his half of the conversation. An accident out near the Double Bar Ranch. Anyone hurt? The caller didn't know. Both men were already on their feet. Oh, that's open country. Be a miracle if he could find out our way there in this storm. Well, we've got to try. All three reached for winter jackets and fur hats. Henry appreciated the fact that both his men responded immediately, in spite of the risks. Someone needs to stay here in case we're needed, he said. Now, Loray, that's been your patrol area. You come with me. It was pitch black and the snow was driving hard. As they left the town, they found themselves guessing as to where, where the road was. It was even worse when they reached open country. This is when I think the force should never given up their horses, noted Larray. Henry had to agree. What we really need is my dog team, he responded. Dog team? Yeah. What did you do with yours? No one told me I knew I'd need one here on the prairie. I left the team with the Hudson Bay trader at my last posting. They were talking to try to cover some of the tension they felt. Someone was out there in that storm who needed their assistance. Would they make it? 
It was a sober, sobering thought. This isn't going to work, said Larray, staring out into the whirling whiteness. I can't even see the trees on the side of the road. Henry fought grimly to keep the slow-moving vehicle on the track. He felt blinded and disoriented. The swirling snow swept across the windscreen in mesmerizing fury. What do you remember from this road, Larray? Anything? It's about 11 miles to the ranch. You need to swing off to the left about a mile and a quarter from town, and there's a coulee about a half a mile further and a bridge, wooden, over the creek. There are some scrub willows along the road for about half a mile, and then it's wide open. Wind sweeps through there like wasn't even a cactus to slow it down. Any fences? Uh, a few, yeah. Lazy Eight has some fence lines. So does that little farm that sits up against the butte. Then the double bar has fences around part of their property, not all of it. Altogether, they ranch about three sections, I think. Never really figured it out. Uh, any steep hills or ditches? There's a couple of good dips. Straight edge on one of them. You don't want to mess with it. How far? It's a few miles from the farm site. Any buildings where we might catch a light? Windows? Anything? Usually, yeah, but I don't know in this soup. Be a miracle if anything shows up. I'd roll down the window and stick my head out, see if I can catch any glimpses of the ditch. Watch for anything that might give us a landmark. Larray leaned out as far as he could. The heavy switch of the wiper, laboring against the snow along the, with the howling wind through wind's open window, limited their conversation. You sure we shouldn't be walking? Larray asked after a while. I can't see a thing out here. Snowshoes. Wish I had my snowshoes. Snowshoes wouldn't show you the way. Henry clamped his jaw tight and fought the car against the wind. Hey, slow down, called Larray. I, th I think this might be our corner. Henry wondered how they could possibly go any slower. It is, yeah, I see the corner post. You gotta take a, make a turn to your left. Easy, easy, not quite yet. Now, take it, turn it easy, a little more. I, th I think we made it. Larray ducked back in. Ha. <sighs> That's the first hurdle, he said, sounding excited. Now, if we could just follow this road. They crawled along, mile after mile. The storm did not slacken, and the snow on the road increased. Henry felt the car slipping sideways and fought for control. Ahead loomed the worst part of the road, and they were already fighting just to stay on it. Larray, Henry said, you ever done any praying? Not since I was a kid. I let my mother do the praying for me, sir. I think it might be wise for us both to do some now, he said. Not in idle jest. They found themselves in the ditch. Uh oh, I think we've done it, called Larray. We're awfully close to some fence posts here. He climbed out and put his shoulder to the back of the car as Henry fought to get the car back up on the road. They both breathed a sigh of relief when the wheels were able to respond. You see anything you recognize? Henry asked as Larray climbed back inside. I hardly know what to look for. You lose all sense of distance in this white whirl. He answered, shaking the snow out of his face. Would it be faster if I ran along in front? Oh, I appreciate your offer, but let's just hang on for as long as we can. The wind would be pretty hard to buck, and I wouldn't want to take a chance on losing sight of you. Well, I don't want to walk, drop over that edge, he warned. Are we getting close? I, I've lost all track, he said, swearing softly. Sorry, boss, about the language, but I have no idea where we are. By some miracle, 
The car clung to the road as they struggled onward against the storm. More than once Henry breathed an in earnest prayer. They would be of no help to the accident victims if they ended up in one themselves. He was glad for a praying mother and father, and Lorraine had said that he let his mother do it the praying. Perhaps they were surrounded by even more prayers than he knew. Lorraine hoisted himself up to lean out the window again. Whoa, he said, letting the breath out in a gasp. We just passed over that drop-off. We missed the edge by about a foot. Henry felt the tension in his chest. So close, yet still going. We shouldn't have much further to go now. Not if it's by the double bar. Through the storm, a dark shape suddenly loomed before them. Henry hit the brakes and skidded sideways. He was sure they were going to hit whatever it was, but the car jerked to a stop just short of the shape that showed through the whiteness. Soon other shadows began to move around them. People running, waving arms, all trying to talk at once. Henry reached down to turn off the ignition. Already Luray was sprinting from the car. Henry zeroed in on the man closest to him and called him out above the howling wind. Take us to the site. Wait a second. Where is that? Take us to the site. What's the situation? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What's the situation? This way, the fellow called back. Over here. Two trucks had collided in the storm. One had been sent reeling into the ditch and landed on its other, on its side. The other, though upright, was the most damaged. Henry winced. Certainly there were injuries. How would they ever get them to a hospital? How many people? he asked, as he closely followed the man who led the way. Three. A couple of young cowboys from the truck in the ditch, and a farmer in the others. Henry was glad no women or children were involved. Anyone badly hurt? Oh, could have been worse. One guy has some pretty bad head cuts. He's up walking around, couldn't keep him down. I think the farmer has a broken leg. We laid him in the back of that truck and pulled a tarp over him. Got them both over there. The other fellow, I, I don't know, he keeps saying his head hurts. That's all I can get from him. My son here and me heard this crash all the way to the barn when, where we were tending stock. Come on down, came on down to check it out. You're the one who phoned for help? No, I, I sent my boy over to the neighbors. We don't have a phone. They had reached the truck where the man was lying under the tarp. Henry heard him groan before they even reached him. Lorraine was already studying the one with the cuts. Henry did a cursor, cursory examination of the leg. It was broken all right. The man would need to be moved soon or he'd be freezing as well. Henry turned to the farmer who'd given what help he could. You say you live close? Right over there, he pointed with his beard. Can we get them over to your house? Oh, you're welcome to do the bat. The boy and I couldn't handle all three alone, and we didn't dare leave them. You don't happen to have a sled. Oh, kids have a small one. C can you send the boy for it, please? All the time they were talking, Henry was checking the man with the head pain. He removed his gloves and let his fingers slide over the skull and neck. Dare they move him? Yet they had no choice. If left where he was, he would soon freeze to death. He spoke to both men now. Just hang on. We're going to get you out of here and get you where it's warm. He took off his heavy jacket and wrapped it around the man's upper body. The wind bit and tore at his shirt. Even Henry, heavy underwear could not hold the cold at bay. Lorraine was at his elbow. Don't think the cuts, guy's cuts are serious. Don't seem to be too deep. Well, he, bet he bled a lot, but head cuts always do. 
At least he could still walk. He should be thankful for that. Well, so should we, said Henry, his voice low. We've got to somehow get these two over to the farmhouse on a kid's sled. They managed it. It wasn't easy, but they did it. One at a time through the storm. The boy, who turned out to be a strapping young lad whom Henry had seen in town on a few occasions, did the pulling. Henry walked beside the most seriously injured man, trying to ease the bumps and jolts as best he could. Leray stayed with the other fellow until the sled returned. <laughs> they would all be glad to get in out of the wind. The house was small. But the woman who met them at the door quit, put everything she had at their disposal. Henry noticed that she was very relieved to have her husband and son safely back inside. From somewhere in a back room a baby cried. He heard another young voice trying to comfort the infant. They brought every lamp in the house to shine on the accident victims. Even so, Henry could not determine the seriousness of the head injury. He dared not give the man anything for pain. The woman worked with cold compresses on his forehead, hoping to somehow ease the throbbing. They knew one another by name. Henry was sure that it, that at least helped ease some of the trauma for the man. However, it also made the farm family more concerned. We got to get us over to that phone and let their folks know they're here, said the farmer. I'm not sure anyone should be going out in that storm, cautioned Henry. The woman looked at her husband, eyes pleading with him to heed the warning. I'll ride old Barney. He's got a nose like a bloodhound. If you are intent upon going, could you call the office and let my man know we made it, requested Henry. And take your rifle just in case you need to signal for help. The words were more to reassure the woman than to help the farmer. Old Barney must have done his job before they had even gotten anyone comfortably settled as possible. The man was back. Got a hold of your man, Davy, he said. She was mighty glad to hear you're all safe. Thanks, mumbled the young man with a broken leg. He was still damp with sweat in spite of his chill. Henry had needed to straighten the leg and bind it as best he could. Now the woman was busy spooning warm soup into the lanky lad. It was the other man who most concerned Henry. He needed a doctor, but to try to get one out in the storm would be foolhardy. Henry prayed the storm would blow itself out before it was too late. He accepted a cup of the hot coffee the older girl was passing around to the huddled group and lowered himself to the floor, his back up against the wall. He looked across the room at Leray. <laughs> the young fellow was going to make a great Mountie. He had handled himself well under pressure. Henry was proud to have him as a member of his detachment. No one in the house that night got much sleep. The woman did go to bed, but Henry was sure with all the extra people and commotion in her kitchen she couldn't have rested well. She had shared some of the blankets from her bed with her unexpected guests. Even through the walls of the little farm home, the coldest of the wind could be felt. Henry took it upon himself to keep the fires going. He hoped there was plenty of wood stacked up outside. If the storm continued much longer, hmm. he must have dozed off and he awoke with a start. He quickly rose to check on the three accident victims. The man with the cuts appeared to be sleeping without too much trouble, but the other two seemed restless. To Henry's great relief, the sun's rays woke him the next morning. Snow still whirled about in the gusts of wind, but the storm itself had subsided. Now they had to get the injured to the hospital. It might take a long time with the roads being drifted over. They would likely have to shovel their way along. He hoped everyone would be able to stand the trip. The farmer and his son went with them, shovels in hand, to dig out the police vehicle. With four of them, it didn't take too long to clear a path, but the motor that had set out in the storm 
refused to start. I've got a good team and a sleigh, offered their host. Henry nodded. It would be slow, far too slow, but at least it might get them to where they could find other help. The man harnessed the team while Henry prepared the injured for travel. They would be taking two to the hospital. The man with the cuts insisted he would heal up on his own. Henry did not argue for long. The fellow looked much better after the blood was washed from his face. Larray forked hay onto the sleigh to make a bed of sorts. They covered the men with borrowed blankets and spread more hay over the top. If at all possible, they hoped to keep the motionless limbs free of frostbite. They had been on the road for less than an hour when they met a truck. Henry flagged the driver down and explained their situation. He offered to transport the men to the town hospital. The men hay and blankets were transferred to the truck bed. The farmer returned on home with his team, carrying words of deep gratitude to his family. They had to shovel their way through drifts a good many times, and Henry was more than glad to see the buildings of the town appear on the horizon. It was an enormous relief to turn the injured over to the doctor's care. They had done what they could, Henry prayed silently that it might be enough. Okay, that's it for today. <laughs> Chapter 14, I'm going to read the first sentence. I hear you're going to give us a real Christmas, Mr. Kingsley remarked as Christine laid a sheaf of papers on his desk. So she's not going home. She's going to cook dinner for Mr. Kingsley and Boyd. Ooh, ooh. Another time, another reading. See you soon.